you guys for bearing with us um, with this. Uh, my name is uh, Richard Kennedy, and I have the great privilege of serving as the executive director of the Tennessee Commission on Children and Youth. And uh, we appreciate you all taking the time to uh, spend some time with us um, this afternoon to really kind of get an update about the Building Strong Brains Tennessee work. Um, I am, um, in full disclosure, completely technologically illiterate, so I'm not going to touch anything as we as we sit here. So um, one of the things that uh, I really wanted to start out uh, the the webinar with you all today is just visiting or revisiting the Building Strong Brains Tennessee mission. Um, I imagine that most of you have had the opportunity to see this before, and I'm not going to insult your intelligence by um, reading it to you, but I do want to point out two um, two thoughts with this. So so when we started the Building Strong Brains Tennessee work, um, internally and externally, we would refer to it as the Building Strong Brains Tennessee initiative. Um, pretty quickly into the work, we realized that we needed to eliminate the word initiative because it makes folks think of a short-term project or a time-bound project. And we realized that if we really want to change the culture in Tennessee, it's going to going to take a, um, some significant time investment. So now we just refer to, to the work as Building Strong Brains Tennessee. There has been a bit of a change in the mission, and I want to point that out for you. And it's specifically the expanding of the languages uh, or the language where we say um, um, practices for children, youth, and young adults. When we first started the work, we really just used the, the, um, the language of children, but quickly realized that we needed to expand that to youth and young adults as well for a couple of reasons. One is that we know from the brain science, and you guys will remember from your uh, training for trainers, is that we have a second opportunity during adolescence for, um, for brain development and really wanted to make sure that we had created that space that we could talk about that. The second is that we very much believe that there is a role for every person with this work and that um, by keeping it very um, specific to children, it could uh, potentially or inadvertently send the message that there's not an opportunity for for other service providers, other advocates, other players um, to be able to impact where they are. And we know that um, that is incredibly um, uh, necessary for the for the work that we're doing. So um, I am incredibly fortunate that Mary Rolando is with us and Mary and I are going to be tag teaming some of the slides. So we are going to pass um, uh, back and forth with those. So I am going to turn things over to Mary to start us um, out with the programmatic parts. Thank you, Richard. And thank you, Jen, for organizing this. We really appreciate it. One of the things that I think you're probably very familiar with is the schematic, which we conceptualized and refer to as the four P's. It is really pretty remarkable um, that this has withstood the test of, of time and scrutiny. However, with giving it that scrutiny, where the four P's standing for philosophy and approach, policies and funding, programs and services, and professional practice, um, we thought that we had done a good job of identifying all of the sectors that you see um, around the uh, the nest of uh, the nesting there. And yet, what we realized um, this past uh, earlier this winter uh, was that we'd left off two really important components. One was higher education and academia, but even larger than that was community. So we have revised um, this schematic in order to represent those areas well. We um, have funded uh, projects in almost all of those areas and look forward to having um, new participation um, upcoming. Right now we've got music. Is somebody on hold? Okay, if you, if you put somebody on hold, Please go on mute. Yes, it stopped. We're really fortunate that Jen is as savvy as she is at manipulating these. And hearing a phone ring again, um, please put yourself on mute, but without music, um, if you need to take a phone call during this um, uh, during this webinar, which is perfectly understandable. 
uh, one of the things that Jen asked us to address was um, what has been, um, you know, going on that may be same or different. And I think that probably you've seen uh, this representation of the infrastructure for uh, Building Strong Brains Tennessee. I want to point out that with the coordinating <clears throat> team identified at the top, which leads this um, activity that is comprised of both public and private sector representatives. We think it's really been important from the very beginning to realize that even though we have, a tre have had a tremendous amount of uh, support from uh, state government uh, and leadership too, that it is um, in the communities where the uh, solutions uh, to issues of ACEs and the potential effects will take place. So at the very top, we do have um, representation from the private sector on the coordinating team. Then we're guided by the public sector steering group. I'm gonna talk about that just a little bit more in terms of some of the pretty big accomplishments of the public sector over a period of time. It's balanced by the private sector steering group, which of course is in recognition that the community solutions and community innovations are, are what is going to change the culture in this state. We have been the beneficiaries of tremendous support from foundations and in-kind resources of Tennessee state government. You see the logos of the uh, support that we've had at the base of, of that frame. Um, I think that a spotlight really has to be put on the ACE Awareness Foundation for the contributions that it has made from the inception of the work in Tennessee um, to look at the serious health problems of adults in Memphis and say the only solution to this is to deal with early childhood development and look at the social determinants of health. And out of that early effort was um, the ACE Awareness Foundation was formed. We are the beneficiaries of a state partnership with um, the ACE Awareness Foundation that permits us to do some things um, at the state level that we might not otherwise be able to support. We've had unwavering support from Casey Family Programs with both um, technical assistance and participation um, in the effort from a, the beginning. The Healing Trust has been so supportive of the uh, work that's gone on with uh, Building Strong Brains Tennessee in great part by um, requesting that any potential grantee of the trust uh, address itself to uh, childhood develop or, uh, child development and uh, trauma responsiveness. And then um, I think it's a, a small estimate of about uh, $375,000 per year that the um, that Tennessee state government is putting into this effort some of which is you're most familiar with because of the tremendous amount of activity that occurs through the uh, Tennessee Commission on Children and Youth. And both Richard and Jen, I think it's appropriate to say applause, applause. The commission staff has just gone the distance and the quality of the work is superior. Um, I'm not gonna read all of these public sector accomplishments, but I do wanna point out a couple of things that I think are important. One is um, under the Department of Children's Services, we've now um, are in the process of concluding the approach to build in all of the Building Strong Brains, um, Tennessee values, metaphors, and constructs of uh, brain development into parents as um, tender uh, healers, uh, which is the path training for foster parents. To be able to reach all the foster parents is just really quite remarkable. And then we've had some of the usual uh, suspects and some of the unusual suspects um, at the table in this work. So I do want to point out that it's very significant, that even within the Department of Correction, there is now a program um, at the West Tennessee uh, Women's Rehabilitation Center called the Children's Gallery, in which every effort is made for uh, mothers who are incarcerated to be able to bond with their children in age-appropriate ways and to the extent that it's possible in the Rehabilitation Center to be um, in a way that is, um, you know, structured but um, culturally appropriate too. Education has just blown it out of the water. What has been accomplished by a very small group of staff in the Department of Education is commendable, and we put a big spotlight on the um, tremendous number of teachers and administrators who went through training for trainers. But now, um, as of this year, FY19. Um, 
72 schools were selected competitively from among 150 who applied to become trauma-informed schools. I think that that is a significant contribution to changing the culture in Tennessee because schools are where children are and we want them to stay there. And so what we know from even some of the things that have been funded in with community innovations um, funded by Building Strong Brains is that uh, when you can reduce the amount of time that a child spends out of the classroom and has more time in the classroom attending and, um, and learning, the better it is for, uh, for all. Health, of course, has been integral to this, and um, just the recognition that ACEs are our primary factor in public health outcomes has been very, very important. Some of you may remember um, that a couple of years ago, the Burfus um, uh, study was called Fact Not Fate, and um, was an early uh, focus on um, on ACEs and the potential effects. It's also very important that um, all the health departments have been trained and they have a, uh, an approach to sustain that training as um, turnover occurs. And then in human services, the ACEs training has been added um, as a part of their expectation for child care providers. Um, all the TANF par uh, partners have been trained um, and they uh, are very, very consistent in taking a two-gen approach that includes um, ACEs um, and uh, early childhood development. Mental health and substance abuse has been in a unique position to um, integrate uh, ACEs and trauma-related um, uh, services into SOCAT because with the major grant um, that uh, is in uh, mental health and with which um, uh, TCCY also participates, it is just the um, all the um, projects come together. Uh, with youngsters, uh, young people, as Richard commented, um, you know, we really want to make sure that um, that we don't discard the notion that youth are still in development and can benefit from uh, trauma-informed and trauma-responsive services. So I think that that's probably a, a major um, fortuitous link between building strong brains and SOCAP. And then uh, the Office of Criminal Justice Programs has been a major contributor with both funds and policy approach, um, and especially with increasing the awareness of handle with care has been a big step forward, and there'll be more to come on that front. And so then with TCCY, actually, Richard, I'm going to defer to you to talk more about this um, because you obviously um, know it. And um, and then I do want to point out that TenCare, um, the MCOs, have been remarkable in what they've done in terms of getting um, their clinical staff trained, um, their uh, case management people are familiar and with um, all of these things, and it's really uh, quite novel. Um, that the managed care organizations, at least the two managed care organizations in Tennessee, um, have really uh, taken this to heart. And when you have uh, uh, major health systems that are contributing, um, it is a big step forward. So as we started this work, one of the things that we realized very quickly was that there was a lot of conversation and awareness that was happening um, within um, offices in downtown Nashville um, within state government folks. And we very quickly realized that if we were going to be successful with any efforts, we had to raise awareness and track simultaneously with not only um, folks that were decision makers in downtown Nashville, but with folks who were actually working with the children, youth, and families in the communities, in their offices, and in, in the, the various regions across the state. So in realizing that, or in that realization, um, it became very apparent that we had to um, develop a training to train folks to be able to use consistent messaging and common language throughout the state so that we would all be tracking on the same page. So when we made that realization there were a couple of couple of different strategies that we looked at one was we looked at um, buying something that had already been created and um, we couldn't really find anything that fit the specific needs for for the state of Tennessee or if they did they were just 
ridiculously expensive that wasn't the best use of the dollars that we had available. So a uh, conversation has, uh, happened and a decision was made that we would create um, a curriculum um, in Tennessee that focused um, on the needs that we have as a state and that would resonate in the communities across the state. And it was really important for us to partner with several different organizations to create that curriculum. So we're very, uh, very fortunate that we had the opportunity to work with the Harvard Center on the developing child. We had the opportunity to work with the Alberta Family Wellness um, Council, had the opportunity to work with Dr. Judy Cameron at the University of Pittsburgh. And then really this, to quote Mary, the secret sauce with, with the curriculum was um, deepening a relationship that we have in Tennessee with an organization called the Frameworks Institute that is really a communication science and research organization that helps translate what can be complicated scientific information in into practical um, um, tools and tips um, for folks to use. So um, over the last two and a half years with the deployment of that um, training for trainers, we've had the opportunity to train over 956 diverse sector individuals to become um, trainers. Um, those trainers have um, presented to more than 39,800 community members across the state of Tennessee. And that is just a number I am incredibly um, proud to, um, for the commission to have been a part of. So the slide that you're seeing now is really um, going to highlight where the counties have been. So we know that there have been trainings that have happened in 67 of the 95 counties. So in the, the top graph you'll see and really with the with the um, legend um, on the bottom right the color coding will tell you the number of um, trainings that have happened. Um, as with a lot of things um, you'll see that the darker the colors are really in, in the more urban areas but I, I specifically want to um, pray folks for all of the work that's happened um, in the the more rural communities across the state that's just a uh, just incredible um, at the Commission we have a, a standing meeting every Monday where we talk about um, the training for trainers work and there are several um, things that that we will process and these slides and this data or these data are some of the things that we process and so so you know there are things that are interesting for us and we, we continue to look at so again in the top slide if you look there's just a band of white along the river and so so that's an interesting aspect for us and uh, really causing us to think about strategies um, for that the other graphic that at the bottom is that there have been community members trained in 93 of the 95 counties. So the two counties that there have been no training, and again, we're very hesitant to say that just because of some limitations with, with our data collection, but the two counties are Moore County and Trousdale County. And so I would ask that if you are a trainer and you have any connections in Moore or Trousdale, we would love to be able to support you to do some, some training in, um, in, in those counties. Um, I think the reality of the situation, like I said, is as I would be willing to gamble that, that there have been folks that live in those communities that have been trained. It's just really a limitation of the of the data that, that we have. So um, we have finished the training for trainers um, cycle for this, um, this fiscal year, um, are working on a plan for an additional um, training for trainers um, um, opportunities next fiscal year. There continues to be um, a desire for that. Um, we are continuing to have conversation about what that would look like, but if you all are asked questions about what future or will there be future opportunities for that training, the answer is yes. So just hang with us as we flush that out and figure out the best way to continue to deploy that training and those resources across the state. That was great, Richard. I love the maps. Those are terrific. Um, the private sector accomplishments are every bit as um, meaningful as those in the public sector. And just to look at them briefly, people have asked in the past, you know, what's the role of the private sector? And basically, it is that um, the private sector participants serve as extenders of the DSB and uh, TN uh, principles, values, and metaphors in their respective uh, participating agency board staffs, programs, and practices. The reach is pretty gr is pretty great, um, and the level of participation has been tremendous. 
uh, I think it's really important that um, some of the organizations have um, implemented uh, BSBTN related trainings um, in uh, among them. Um, I think that it's very important that the um, private sector creates um, the, the face of that model of collective impact. One of the things that uh, w occurred very early on in this work was with ACE Nashville um, that was developing a collective impact model. We were familiar with it um, in the Department of Children's Services because of having something referred to as the Three Branches Institute, which is where the uh, three branches of uh, the, where the, each of the individual branches of state government um, executive, legislative, and judicial have a more powerful agenda when it's brought together. That was the same message that um, ACE Nashville was bringing to the table. And now I think that we see as the private sector um, steering group members continue to work together that that impact um, is making a difference. I want to call out especially though um, what I think is really quite remarkable and give special recognition to the Sycamore Institute for publication of the economic cost of ACEs in Tennessee. It's gotten nationwide attention when it uh, specifies that the annual cost is as much as $5.2 billion per year. You get people's attention. And so thank you to the Sycamore Institute um, and Laura Berlin and your colleagues uh, for doing such a remarkable um, piece of work, and we know that there's more to come. And then the other thing is that I think that um, we want to give recognition to the private sector as accomplishments is that successfully demonstrating the value of the community innovations that have resulted in an increase in appropriations for ACES related activities and having that in the recurring budget means that what what you're doing in the field is making a difference. It's appreciated and um, and people um, are taking note. Um, one of the good decisions that I think we made early on in the first year when we were surprised with funding was that um, we wanted this to be a statewide initiative and so um, tried to equalize the funding um, east, middle, and west. It served as a wonderful spark plug for a lot of work that has occurred since then. And so we do appreciate the private sector step, stepping up to the plate. And so I'm not going to go through um, the, all of these lists of the community innovations that have been funded over a period of time, but I think it's important to think about um, that early uh, schematic of the four Ps and the sectors. We have not um, tried to force any um, project into a sector, but rather after evaluating the types of proposals that we've gotten and then saying, well, where did they fall? We have found that um, that you in the field and um, and certainly in academia have really stepped up to the plate with true innovations that are um, making a difference in this um, state uh, well statewide and so um, and also I would say that uh, all of this I think is going to be archived right Jim and then um, these are uh, also posted on our respective websites and so when we are able to even identify that there's been uh, projects in media and as of this year in the faith-based community, we know that the tentacles of this work are spreading uh, pretty effectively. And then again, to the extent that this is a statewide initiative, or it was started out as a statewide initiative, and now you know our intent is to sustain this with the really valuable work that's going on. Each of these 35 projects that you see depicted on this map will close um, on June 30 of this year. Um, all of the grantees were notified about a year ago that this was the plan, and it's because we wanted to uh, start a new cohort of um, community innovations with uh, the new administration. So we applaud every one of these that has been so successful and um, appreciate the effort, and we've tried to make it as easy as possible for projects to um, do their jobs well. And so I'm going to wrap up my part um, by commenting that we uh, had a, a summit. Um, I'm sure that some of you um, were able to attend that. We, it was on September 11 uh, of this past year. Uh, we were celebrating successes and imagining the possibilities going forward. So um, 
when we uh, got resources in the recurring funds, it was really um, a real statement of sustainability. And what we learned at the um, at the summit again um, helped us to move our effort forward. The three major areas um, that were covered in keynotes were the science of telling better stories, which again grounded us in even new thinking from the Frameworks Institute. Science-based innovation and foundations of resilience, basically uh, Harvard Center for the Developing Child's um, Al Race, talking about how important it is um, not only to have evidence-based programs, but how important it is to be able to innovate in order to be able to find out what works, who it works with, who it doesn't work with. And so that has prompted our thinking, I think, really uh, very effectively uh, toward how important it is for us to try new things. Things. And then um, the third was the power of cross-sector collaboration to build a culture of health in which the message from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation was, if you are concerned about the ACEs that we typically describe as being um, that of um, uh, neglect, uh, physical abuse, uh, mental abuse, uh, incarcerated parents, the eight or ten that we typically um, are concerned about, then what there here is why you need to be concerned about stormwater management. And basically, um, all of the uh, these uh, keynote spe uh, keynote addresses are on the website that you see at that base of the uh, the base of that frame. And if you were not able to attend the summit, I encourage you. Uh, to go there because in every instance with each of those three keynotes, it's well worth uh, sitting there for 50 minutes and learning new science because as is pointed out uh, by Al Race is that there is new science and we need to stay up um, up with it. So Richard, why don't you talk about strategic planning? So uh, Mary would, would not um, be self congratulatory in any shape, form, or fashion, so I'm going to do that for her. But the Department of Children's Services and Mary's team really deserves an incredible amount of recognition for the work that they did to um, with, the, with the Building Strong Brains grants. Um, you heard Mary use the word unexpected money, and that was really what it was um, the, the first year of funding, and then really looking at ways to make sure that the money is equitably distributed across the state um, both urban and rural areas, as well as um, trying to navigate funding for all of the, the different se sectors that um, she she highlighted. And that work just gets better and better and better. So I want to make sure that we never pass up an opportunity to thank Mary and her team for, for what they do with that. Um, so one of the things that we had to face um, within the last um, six months to a year, just kind of some brutal facts of, of um, our reality is that we were going to have an administration change in Tennessee. And I would, I would say all day long that um, part of the reason that I feel like we've been so successful with, with the work in Tennessee um, definitely lies um, at the feet of Governor um, Haslam and Chrissy Haslam, and also um, Deputy Governor, former Deputy Governor Jim Henry was just such an incredible champion for this work. So we realized that they're um, moving on and a new administration was going to create some challenges and, um, and some opportunities. The second brutal fact that we had to really think about with this is that we knew that um, there was going to to be a significant turnover in members of the General Assembly and that we would have roughly or approximately a third new members of the General Assembly. So, so we had to have some conversation about how do we continue the momentum, how do we build on what is has already happened and the plan for what will happen across the state at the same time um, educating and continuing to build champions in the new General Assembly and in the new administration. So we were incredibly fortunate that the Department of Health offered to fund some strategic planning work. So um, we worked with um, Strategy and Leadership, a consulting firm, to really take us through uh, a 
pretty much a multi-month um, strategic planning process. And so what you're seeing in front of you is really kind of the word cloud that came out of an all-day session um, with numerous stakeholders. Um, and those were the, the topics that were, were brought up, and you, you will see kind of how, how those kind of fell out. So what we realized and what came out of that strategic plan is, is what does a vision for success look like? So we knew that we had to have universal awareness and commitment to not only the mission, but for the strategies um, to accomplish those goals to fulfill the mission. We knew that we had to have competent, committed, inspirational leaders at all level. And so one of the things that I will say at the commission to our team often is that every person that serves on our team and that works on our team is a leader and people lead from where they are in organizations whether those are service provision organizations whether those are courts whether those are communities and elected officials but everyone has the opportunity to serve in that role and and, and our job should be to make sure that they are as equipped as possible to um, to do that work we know that we have to have broad community engagement um, we know that we have to have common practice implementation um, we know that we have to have a system to organize data and really look at the analysis or analyze that data and share those results. And I can tell you that that traveling across the state and talking about the, this work in a variety of settings, one of the questions that I always get is how do you know what you're doing is making a difference? How do you know it's working? And so we continue to think about that and that rose to the top um, with the strategic planning work. Um, we have to have a targeted system for marketing strategy. Um, and the other thing that we realize is that we really have an opportunity for business engagement and that a lot of times it feels like that when we're talking about this work and we're talking to folks who live, work, and play in our world, they just get it. But when we start talking outside, it's really important for us to have that language that really um, shows that, that the future prosperity of Tennessee depends upon what we do now and the importance of business leaders understanding that their future workforce is being developed and and um, um, right now and then we also really um, talked about the need to have a formalized infrastructure support and so I, I will tell you that that I am routinely asked, where does Building Strong Brains Tennessee live? Who is responsible for that? And I can honestly say, and do honestly say, that it, it really is a true collaborative, that it's owned by the public sector and private sector steering groups, and that, that each of those groups have the opportunity for input. But so we realize that there, there's probably a need for a little bit more um, formalization around that. So out of the strategic planning work, there really um, um, rose to the top four strategic priorities. One, in, and we have thought about those in terms of buckets. So engaging, equipping, connecting, and supporting. So we realize that we have to engage stakeholders, key leaders, and communities, and we have to equip those uh, equip providers and communities with tools and training. We have to connect learnings and share information. Um, as Mary highlighted all of the previous grantees and the, uh, the amazing work that has happened with those grantees, there really is an opportunity to share that with folks who may not receive funding that could incorporate or implement lessons learned or successes from that work. And then also to really support the work that's happening through um, financial models, marketing, and infrastructure structure. So the way that we're going to get there is is through several different strategies. So one is we are going to sustain and enhance um, the strategy to increase public awareness and action. Um, and we are doing that in a variety of ways. We are continuing the training for trainers work. We um, are doing some knowledge mobilization work that I'm going to dig into a little bit deeper in, in one of the next slides. Um, we still have access to some amazing um, uh, public awareness um, um, tools, um, some being a documentary series that was developed by WCTE in Cookville, um, but also 
also with some new things around a social media campaign that will be coming coming down the pike in the the very very near future. Um, we're going to get there by su supporting the extension of um, scientific um, learnings through the learning communities that that Jen Drake Croft on our team really coordinates and um, through through the base camp um, work. So if you are not a member of base camp and you've been through a training for trainers, then certainly we would want to um, have you um, have access to to that. Um, again, just incredibly fortunate with the with the funding and the appropriations that the legislature has has provided. So continue to be a good steward of those dollars. Continue to cultivate two gen and three gen approaches to community solutions. Um, I think one of the key um, um, strategies for us is to continue to seek input from stakeholders. And again, I'm going to talk about that a little more in the knowledge mobilization slide um, coming up. And then a real opportunity, as I previously discussed, about engaging the business community to recognize the investment uh, or the value of the investment um, in children and young folks. So one of the things that I am incredibly excited about is that um, we have realized that there continues to be a need for knowledge. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm kind of getting a strange look and I'm afraid I messed up something. Um, so, um, um, a need for communities to have the resources to be able to solve the problems um, of their communities or address problems or challenges within within their communities. Um, I will often tease with some of our staff and kind of refer back to the Wizard of Oz and that communities by and large have what they need to solve the problems. Obviously there will always be a need for training and awareness and additional resources, but communities know, know what they need. So through the infrastructure of the Commission on Children and youth. We have nine regional councils. We have one um, full-time staff person that is housed in each of the state's nine development districts, and they are using some of their time to really coordinate knowledge mobilization teams. And so they had a very kind of um, ambiguous or squishy kind of directive as they started this work, but it was really to create that space or that opportunity for anyone who's interested in this work to come together to to think about how they can align their resources, align services, align practices to really have impact in their communities. And so we um, and have realized that you know defining community is something that has to happen at those regional levels. There are some um, counties that are working uh, that will do that will do work. There are some cities and counties that will do work. There are some neighborhoods in cities that that will tackle certain things. There are some um, multi-county efforts, but anyway, each of the regional um, coordinators are at differing um, points in the knowledge mobilization work. And so if you are interested in plugging into the knowledge mobilization work that is happening um, um, in your particular part of the state, um, if you will um, go to the commission's website, that's tn.gov forward slash tccy, you're going to see in one of the tabs the uh, information about the regional councils, and you'll see the counties that comprise each individual region as well as a contact person for, um, or a regional coordinator for that particular um, region. Um, a variety of things are happening um, across the state in uh, uh, northwest and southwest regions. They are really looking at hosting a one-day summit in the coming months. Um, others are very much in an awareness raising um, um, stage where they are meeting with locally elected officials and other decision makers to bring them up to speed with this knowledge. But again, I, I would say with this that there is more than enough work to go around with this, and we have more than enough seats at our tables across the state to ensure that everyone has the opportunity for input into the work that is happening. Thank you, Richard. That was um, really a very, very good description. Um, I want to uh, say just a few things about the announcement of funds that was posted on um, February 1 of this year that um, we tried to give as much time as possible to the potential applicants to be able to get uh, as much time uh, as possible in order to generate good proposals. So it's be, it will be a, a full six weeks 
that the organizations have um, to do that. There are two areas of focus in the announcement of funds this year. One is uh, typical child development interventions and or direct services for children, youth, young adults, and other and their caretakers, as we have done in the past. I want to say, because there was a question raised about this, that it is that area um, that that focus that does include uh, professional development um, and uh, other interventions where um, people would increase their skills. The second, though, is where we did put a bit more um, uh, focus this year than in past because of the things that we've learned, um, as I mentioned from the summit and the work that we've been able to do with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and that is a focus on community conditions that are or may contribute to ACEs. And so um, the, uh, we know there's a tremendous amount of interest this year. Of the 2.45 million in state appropriations um, that are made available, uh, about 2.2 million of that will go uh, into community. And um, we are uh, expecting um, a large number of proposals in that we have about 106, maybe as well as 110 letters of interest and a letter of interest is required with a proposal, but you didn't have to send one ahead of time. It's one of those odd things about the process, which we acknowledge. And then um, a week ago today, um, we had 94 people on the uh, WebEx um, to have an overview of the announcement of funds and to answer questions. And so the responses to those questions um, about the announcement uh, of funds are at the website that you see posted in this frame. Proposals are due by uh, 4 o'clock on Friday, the March 15. I wish I'd made it noon since all of them have to be opened on that Friday, <laughs> but that's okay. And then um, uh, by virtue of the, this being a document that has been posted, uh, we are obligated to notify applicants um, by March 29 um, uh, the results of the evaluation. And the intent then is to try to have all the contracts go into place um, by uh, July 1. So we're optimistic, based on past experience, that we will be able to uh, fund uh, really viable projects statewide, that there will be a variety because we know that so many of you, and certainly um, we appreciate that there is no silver bullet, that there's been many lessons learned over the past three years that can contribute to our continuing um, to advance this work. So um, I think we're almost at that point, Jen, where we can take questions. But um, Richard, if you want to comment. Yeah, so what I would want us to um, to really conclude with with the presentation before those questions is that, you know, as, as I said earlier, with all of the work that I've ever had the opportunity to participate with, this is probably some of the most exciting. And so I really believe and am confident in our ability to collective and our collective ability to change the culture in Tennessee and to change the culture from a concept or a question of what's wrong with this child to what happened to this child. And I would even go a step further with that and say, and how can we wrap supports and services around that child and their families to help them recover from um, those adverse childhood experiences they may have um, may have had. So, Jen, it's all you. Wonderful. So, um, I've got the chat box open. If uh, there's about a hundred of you on this webinar, so we're not going to entertain, entertain questions um, by having people um, ask them. But instead, if you will put them your questions into the chat box, uh, I will repeat the question for the benefit of the folks that have called in, um, and then I will get Mary and or Richard to answer them. So go ahead and we'll give a few moments to, to let people begin to um, chat those questions in. All right, I'm not seeing any questions pop up. 
<laughs> Richard, Richard says we may have questions for you. Um, while we're waiting to see if anybody does type in a question, um, I do want to remind you all about Children's Advocacy Days, which is going to be held at War Memorial Auditorium on uh, March 12th and 13th. Um, you can register online, and we will send a link following this webinar um, for you all. It's, it's a free event, and it'll be wonderful. It is um, patterned after te TED Talks this year, so we're having our own version CAD Talks, and we expect that it'll be great. Um, we also will be planning um, to have another webinar as a part of our webinar series where our own Steve Petty will be talking about legislation um, that impacts children and youth and impact, you know, could potentially um, help mitigate adverse childhood experiences. Um, and he'll be walking us, us through that next month, March 21st at 1 o'clock. So you all will get an invitation for that. So I see uh, a question from Tanya Elkins here that says, is there a plan to have more trainings in other languages? I noticed there are some videos available in Spanish now, but it would be great to identify trainers who could train parents or different groups. So Tanya, that is a great question. I will say we have been working with our partners at the University of uh, Memphis to actually, uh, there's a professor of social work there who is, I think her name is Elena Delavane. Um, but but she has been working with us to translate our um, our training for trainers um, PowerPoint into Spanish. So that is almost done and will be distributed to the rest of you. We also um, had our partners at um, Metro Public Health Department in Davidson County uh, translate a lot of our. Uh, uh, materials about adverse childhood experiences. So if you've seen our one pager or our bookmarks, uh, they've translated that. We're just working with um, our in-house design shop um, to, to format those, and then those will become electronically available, I would say probably within the next six weeks. Um, so the next question we have is, will you be willing to share BSB's strategic plan so that the community groups can plan to remain in alignment? So I'm looking at Mary and Richard here. Yeah. Perfect. So Mary, just in case um, the sound has been a little off, Mary mm -hmm. is uh, willing, certainly willing to post it on the website, so we will let you know when that's available. Um, and she'll post probably more of the broad overarching goals um, so that folks can remain in alignment. Um, the next question is, do you have a master list of community partners who are ACES trained and prepared to address what services you can share with this group? Uh, this will assist our case managers with coordination of care. And I should say that this is from one of our partners at Amerigroup, which is wonderful, and a trainer. Um, so what I would say is, you know, a master list of community partners um, really changes so frequently that it is hard to, to have that. However, we do have kidscentraltn.com um, where everybody who receives state funding um, is listed and you can find um, those services by zip code. Also, your local 211 should have um, services available. And then, you know, if anybody wanted to share specific types of services in any of the regional base camp groups, um, we would welcome that. Anything you all want to add to that? Okay. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to give it maybe one more minute, see if there are any other questions that pop up. All right. Well, we want to really thank you all for spending your afternoon with us to hear about some of the progress with Building Strong Brains Tennessee. And we plan to regularly, like on an, at least an annual basis, engage with you all to keep you guys um, abreast of developments that, that are happening with Building Strong Brains. So I hope you all have a great rest of your week. Keep on doing great work.